Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for coming to our event. Uh, my name is Olenka Gu. I'm an editor at the Commons Journal, and I will be moderating this panel, which we named Women During the War Between Defense of the Country and Lack of Social Security. And this event is part of our annual conference. So I encourage you to visit uh, the rest of the panels uh, tomorrow as well. And Today, we've got three speakers, three amazing researchers, uh, Marta Havryshko from Ukraine, Veronika Grzebalska from Poland, and Anwar Mhajne from uh, Palestine. So um, I think they will um, introduce themselves uh, briefly, mm, maybe tell more about um, what they've been uh, doing. So uh, each speaker will have uh, 15 minutes to speak. And then we've got the Q&A session. And for, for our audience, if you've got any questions to, uh, to the speakers, please text them in the chat. And after all the presentations, we will uh, discuss the questions. Um, yeah, I think that's that's it. Um, yeah, we, we've already said that we've got a simultaneous translation. So if you need one, then press on the globe um, icon. Okay, so I invite uh, Marta Havrishko to speak. Thank you so much, Olenka. Hello, everyone. First of all, I want to express solidarity with all Ukraine women who now suffer uh, consequences of this brutal Russian aggression. Also express solidarity to those to all those women in war-torn countries, in war-torn zones. Couple words about me. I'm Marta Havreshko. I'm a historian, gender scholar, a Holocaust scholar, and genocide scholar. When the full-scale invasion, Russian full-scale invasion started, I left Ukraine together with my nine-year-old son, and now I'm a refugee scholar. Today, I'm a professor of Holocaust and anti-Semitism studies um, at the Clark University, and I have basically a privileged position to, to continue my research in safety without threats, without, uh, without threats, first of all, to my, uh, to my child. And my example, actually, I really believe that my example is one of those examples of, you know, uh, challenges that um, uh, Ukraine female scholars now nowadays uh, faced. Because at the first year of the war, I was in Basel, uh, at Basel University, I was in Switzerland together with my son, and I took my nephew with me. So I um, had a feeling that I am a lonely mother. And I was trying to navigate between work. Uh, you know, um, I had classes. I had, you know, class about gender war in Ukraine, the Basel University. I really enjoyed it. But I was so, you know, uh, I was so exhausted by basically by this balance of work and motherhood. And uh, I believe that many, many female scholars actually had the similar uh, challenges during, during the war. But today I will talk about other challenges and other groups of women. My presentation will be very short and I can't basically talk about different groups, all the groups uh, of women, you know, affected by, by this war. So I will concentrate basically on my sphere of expertise. My sphere of expertise is military, gender, nationalism, and gender-based violence during war. So today, let me share my screen. I have a short presentation just to, uh, just to uh, make my point more clear. Uh, please enable me to share a screen if possible, because I have the sign host disabled participant screen sharing. So I will appreciate this ability. Uh, just one second, Martha. Yes, yes, please.
Could you try again? Yes. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, do you see my screen? Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. You did. Okay, thank you so much. So today I want to talk about hidden, most, mostly hidden, gendered cost of war for women in Ukraine. And first of all, I want to talk about military women. We know that uh, when the occupation of Crimea happened and, you know, a Russian invaded uh, Donbass and uh, the conflict started in Donbass, many women um, motivated by patriotism, by this idea to sacrifice their lives and their knowledge uh, um, to, to defend their motherland, they entered military in a massive way. And as you see from those numbers, nowadays, Ukraine military uh, is among those militaries who have the biggest number of Ukraine of female service women, approximately 15%. So today there are more than 43,000 women in armed forces of, U um, uh, of Ukraine. And what is very important, this number have increased by 40% nowadays compared to 2021. So the full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine basically motivated women even more to enter military, you know, to, to sacrifice their war privilege, because we know that still for men in Ukraine, it's a mandatory military service and and for women, it's a choice. So it, uh, it's an expression of their free will. And this most visible prize for this war is a separation with children, you know, with their parents, with their loved ones, but also those scars of war, these disabilities, which are consequences of those war. For example, for example, Ruslana is only, Rusa is only 19 years old and he lost her, uh, her leg. And nowadays she's trying to reconsider her entire life, her plans and so on. Adriana Susak is a brave woman who is in the military from 2014. She made so much to support other women in the military. But also most visible prize of this war is the death of our military women like death of Irena Svila, my friend who died defending Kiev right at the, uh, uh, during the beginning of, of the Fulski invasion. We know that um, uh, according to official numbers that, um, that were um, voiced um, more than, I believe, one year ago by Ministry of, of Defense of Ukraine, 100 uh, women lost their lives from the uh, from the beginning of the full ski invasion but many more also uh, here you see many more faces of those who lost their lives even previously even before 24 february and ukraine veteran female veterans women's veterans movement uh, put their effort to make those women more with, uh, visible, to make to acknowledge their uh, sacrifice. For example, by planting you know trees uh, to commemorate the memory in Kyiv, Kramatorsk, Kyiv, and other cities. You can visit the website of Women's Veteran Organization and see by yourself how many activities basically women nowadays are develop. And many of them are connected to defense of women's rights in Ukraine military. They uh, they made so many uh, they did so much uh, for visibility of women, for recognition of women, recognition of their their war efforts. But still, we have so many challenges that are invisible. We we have basically an invisible front line for many female soldiers. And this front line is connected to sexual harassment, gender discrimination, and sexual violence within the rank of Ukraine army. We know that it's not unique, this phenomenon is not unique for Ukraine army. We recently, we saw this, you know, uh, news, uh, uh, I believe it was two years ago when, you know, 20 year, uh, 20 year old uh, Vanessa Gillen, um, uh, US service woman was killed and sexual harassment was actually the case of sexual harassment was involved. And nowadays what we have in consequences of this, that, you know, that the procedure of reporting, investigating now changed dramatically. And we know that some special service is in 
place in U.S. Army and this algorithm, how to report, how to protect their rights is very clear for service women. We don't have the same in Ukraine military. We have two strong, uh, two strong women, service women, who raised their voice and broke silence about the sexual harassment in, in the military. What they received instead, they received support from feminist organizations, from different NGO, but they didn't receive justice. Justice wasn't served to both Valeria Sikal and Olga Darkach. But what we observe now, after actually the full start of full scale invasion, everything developing of these politics, even media discourse now is stopped regarding the sexual violence. And how we learn about the experiences of women in this regard, we learn from Western media. Some brave Ukrainian service women like Nadia Harain was not was reluctant to talk about Guardian, and she said about her experience of sexual harassment, how she was trying to avoid this, and the experience of other women who were back, uh, uh, who were actually who experienced pressure from their commander who, who demanded sexual favors. Instead, he threatened them that their men would be sent to the front line. It's only one case that leaked to the Western media. And then Western media approached military defense of Ukraine and they started to demand answers. But so far, we don't know what happened to this commander and what happened to this case in general and how and Nagia Harain is coping with this. Uh, Harain is coping with this after revealing this sensitive information. Another another problem for um, is existing connected to you know androcentric um, and masculine values of military system in general and in, in its patriarchal nature connected to sexual harassment and discrimination of LGBT people. And one of the research recently conducted showed several showed several cases of sexual violence and sexual harassment harassment that LGBT people in um, Ukraine army experienced. Thanks to Invisible Battalion and their advocacy campaign and their research and their enormous efforts, we know that every 10, uh, 10 women in Ukraine military had experience of sexual harassment. But what we have instead, what is the response from Ukraine military? When you investigating actually the site, exploring the site of Ministry of Defense, you will find easily some, you know, materials about patriotic education within the military. But you will never find actually the ad algorithm, some information, how to report, how to pr uh, protect yourself, yourself. You will never find this information at the website of general staff of armored forces of Ukraine nowadays. You just can find this information. Instead of them, uh, that some feminist organizations like your fam, they develop some, you know, practical materials for women, for men in the military. Um, and they just provided information how to report and how to protect themselves. A very, um, very outstanding actually case connected to to representation of women in the military nowadays is connected to former Azo movement and now it's the most famous, more, most celebrated military unit. And um, uh, you see on this print screen, members of this unit made um, uh, made jokes during some uh, this uh, show. They made sexist, numerous sexist in, and misogynist jokes uh, about their uh, female peers. But also, uh, those jokes had very sexualized nature, meaning reference that all women who are needed in the army could, you know, and should provide sexual basically favors to real defenders of the nation, meaning male defenders. And what was the reaction of military women? They were outraged. Some of them cried like, you know, medical combat, uh, 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 combat medic uh, Olesa Karamelka, who raised her voice uh, during this show and started just to object and said, you, it, it's unfair. You don't actually, she said, you don't uh, respect women in the military and our war efforts. Other women started to share publicly their experience of sexual harassment and gender discrimination, like Irina Klemenova. You, you can see her uh, post on Facebook. 
it's visible. Another prominent Ukrainian service woman, uh, Yarina uh, Chernohu, started to basically express the idea that women nowadays in Ukrainian military face two fronts against the Russian enemy and against the gender stereotypes. And she also addressed this myth of so-called field martial law or pochodna polivaya jena, making reference basically you know, to, to all those, you know, perception of women within the military. But what we have, what the response we have from our commander in chief in the armed forces, did he support those women who express their concerns about gender discrimination, sexual harassment? No, instead he's engaging in promoting, let's say, controversial, you know, art projects where women are still portrayed as sexualized and female soldiers, first of all, not soldiers, but female soldiers, as you know, in the project of Malba. Um, Janivska, and also Zaluzhny, as we know, supported this very controversial, you know, calendar made by journalists and uh, um, heavily discussed within Ukrainian society. You can easily find information about this, you know, project and how it was debated in the feminist circles and how um, it was debated among male and female service women. But, you know, here we have example of respect. We have example of a respectful representation of women in the military and their war efforts. And I really believe that we uh, should put pressure on our authority, on Ukrainian authority, to make efforts uh, to show respect to, uh, to service women. And another question I believe I, I, I will address concerns sexual violence in war. We know that first cases of sexual violence appeared right after occupation of Crimea in Donbass, in places of deprivation of liberty, torture chamber, and so on and so on. So far, according to the Office of Prosecutor General in Ukraine, we have um, um, almost 240, not, not almost, but 248 cases, but all we know that this is the top of the iceberg because those cases concern only those people who are willing and who are ready fight for justice. But we have maybe thousands of men and women who are silent for, due to different reasons, stigma, rape culture, you know, fear of reprisal. We know that 18% of Ukraine territory is still occupied, so we don't have access to those people, and so on and so on. So the numbers are much, much higher. And the main concern for me is that nowadays thousands of military men and women are in Russian captivity. And from different wars in Congo, war on terror, infamous Abu Ghraib, we know that uh, places of detention are places where sexual violence, sexualized torture are widespread. So here you see the examples of sexual violence used by Russian military in Ukraine. And among them, you see uh, specific gender like castration, panectomy, or genital mutilation um, uh, experienced mostly by, by men, but rape and threats of rape, again, rape um, is experienced mostly by women. So both women and men, girls and boys nowadays are targeted by they experience sexual violence in many cases differently. So uh, many women after rape are, uh, are you know, beaten or during the rape, even elderly women, we have the youngest victim, uh, uh, youngest survivors, survivors of sexual violence is four year old and the elder one is 86 year old, you know, and those women experience have, have um, heavy injuries to one. But what we um, have in terms of survivor-centered approach, in terms of uh, coping strategies, in terms of help, we know from many women that those women who suffer sexual violence, like Helena Tyshenko, didn't receive appropriate support. She was approached by Ukra Ukraine law enforcement um, representatives, and they conducted uh, they conducted um, an interview with her. But she said, "You know, I was raped. I was infected by venereal disease. Please help me." And she didn't receive any psychological and uh, and uh, um, support and medical treatment. She didn't receive financial support. So it's still a problem. And another problem and another issue for women is, um, is a pregnancy as a result of rape. 
We know that uh, from Rwanda, from Yugoslavia, from uh, Congo, Sierra Leone, we know that carrying products of rape for women is uh, is like a torture. Many women want to get rid of this, you know, and Federa, Polish organizations trying to help Ukraine women and Feminoteca in Poland um, are trying, you know, despite of all odds, despite of harsh law in Poland, they are trying to provide the service for women to, to bring them to Germany and other countries to uh, give them medication and to help those women. Valeria, uh, Valeria 20, uh, 42 was raped by Russian soldiers, but her case will not only the PTSD, as you see uh, from this quote from her interview uh, to Western media, but she also experienced victim blaming from her um, uh, community members. They started to share idea, idea that she actually entertained Russian soldiers. So basically, we still have in place this victim blaming, the culture of victim blaming that harm women and prevent them from speaking up. And instead of this, we have some, you know, uh, discourse of what to do just to avoid rape, you know, prevent, uh, how to prevent, provoke disgust, um, imitate convulsions, and so on, so on. So the problem with these instructions is that they basically reinforce and enforce, in general, this rape myth. Because everyone can just take this instruction and ask women, did you do that? Did you do that? Maybe you did uh, not enough to prevent rape. Maybe it's your fault, you know? So I believe those instructions are very problematic. We, you know, I will not, uh, now, uh, I, um, I will not, for the, sake of, uh, for the sake of the time, I will not concentrate uh, on mental, physical, uh, psychological, social, intimate um, consequences of, you know, of sexual ones and women and their children who also suffer sexual ones because they witnessed in many cases humiliation and uh, and uh, um, violence against their, their mothers. And some of them experienced great difficulties. Some of them were trying to take their life, like, you know, this 18 year old, girl, uh, 18 year old son of one of rape survivor. But what is very also important you know what I was um, I was approached by a German uh, by German media who discussed um, who discussed the question of sexual violence uh, during the war. And you know that Sarah Wagenknecht and other politicians uh, from IFD, this conservative far-right group in, in Germany, nowadays are spreading the myth, uh, basically, that Ukraine and Russia are committing sexual violence on the uh, on the regular basis, and they are equal in this. Uh, that's why I was approached just to provide them, you know, uh, sufficient, you know, arguments how to deal with this, you know, discourse that nowadays is spreading in in uh, Western countries. And I was trying to explain that, you know, we should uh, basically uh, we should basically understand that sexual violence in war could have different manifestations and serve different uh, different roles. You know, uh, have different functions. For example, it could be opportunistic rape when some you know people, some men are trying to just prove their masculinity to to exercise their power. You know, to 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 have sex uh, sexual gratification and they rape. You know, because they have this possibility. But they are trying to hide this because this rape do not serve this coll uh, collective aims, meaning political or uh, military uh, aims. But what we have instead in terms of Russia, Russian military, they are, we have commanders in world, we have commanders do not prevent sexual violence, we have complete denial on the official level, we have even celebration of those units who committed um, sexual crimes and other crimes against humanity and war crimes in Bucha and other, you know, in other regions uh, of Ukraine. So we have so many signs that actually prove that sexual violence by Russian military is basically tool of war, instrument of war, and females' bodies and male bodies become became a battlefield for Russian military. But we should remember that not uh, that the soldiers are not angels and during war under the pressure under you know many other circumstances you know they could commit uh, they could commit a sexual violence so that's why what we know from western uh, western media and what we know from un reports that 
almost 10% of sexual violence nowadays documented are committed by Ukraine armed forces or some members of territorial defense, defense units or some civilian members, as just civilians, ordinary people. Some of the cases are uh, were performed, you know, were documented in places of detention, basically. Uh, so it's important to talk about this and Ukraine shouldn't basically deny this, but to face this, recognize this, and said, we will deal with this, you know, we will bring those people to justice, you know, we will persecute those crimes because we are not, uh, you know, ready to tolerate this, you know, but what, so basically we have some sort of hierarchy of victims, when some victims in Ukraine, especially victims of Russian military aggression, are um, enjoy, enjoying basically empathy, but other victims are hidden. Among them are, for example, victims of domestic violence. Numbers show numbers show that uh, we have great decline, as you see from this report. We have great decline in numbers of domestic violence, and uh, you know those persons who said no, we have no this, we don't have this problem. We'll show you those numbers. But six million of Ukraine um, people nowadays are abroad, and those numbers not uh, uh, they, they do not actually reflect this um, uh, this uh, reality. Eighteen percent of Ukraine territory is actually occupied. We have you know also, but another problem was what we know from NGO, from women's rights activists, that women are afraid even to address the question, this question because they really afraid to be blamed that they um, actually facilitate Russian propaganda. They are working against Ukraine military. They undermine this perception of Ukraine soldier as a decent man, honorable man true defender and, you know, angel and so on, so on. Like in this case, in case of this woman, um, a mother of two children who just escaped from his uh, from his uh, husband because he turned into one domestic abuser. And when he when she was trying to seek support, uh, people said, you know, you should just shut up and, you know, enjoy your status of being a wife of a war hero. That's why I believe I don't have more time, but I want you to just, you know, navigate my, so motherhood in what time, it's a very important issue. We should remember about this, you know, about, you know, two of my sisters, they gave birth in shelters uh, at the beginning of the war, and they experienced all this, you know, and um, sanitary conditions and so on and so on. Uh, displacement, you know, so many challenges faced by, by many women, but also, we have another invisible front for these women. Women are celebrated, those who are taking care nowadays about their wounded soldiers, about their wounded uh, husband. But can you imagine basically how their, uh, you know, work opportunities, their educational opportunities are limited nowadays because they are basically forced to, to take care about, about their husbands because, you know, uh, nowadays this uh, support from the state is not sufficient, you know, and psychological support and so on and so on. So we have these romantic stories and romantic representation, you know, in Ukrainian media, but, you know, the problem is more and more complex and um, numerous pauses by those women who actually address the question and raising money for treatment of their husbands is just one of of the you know sign of these complex complex problems also i want to end my presentation with economic burdens you know nowadays we know that the ukraine economy is heavily dependent on us and um, uh, on us in the eu you know in in the in the family of my you know mother my mother my, my father my, my sister uh, so both of them are pensioners um, uh, um, all, uh, both of them have uh, cancers and my sister has a um, um, baby with disability and basically she can't work. So in one, just in, in one family, we have three persons four per persons completely dependent on Western support. And we know nowadays that, you know, that pensions are not 
increasing. Salaries of teachers are not increasing because of the economic situation, you know, because of the war and because uh, of the fact that many, um, that nowadays the budget Ukraine is very military centered. So it's an invisible price of this war, you know, for teachers, for educators, you know, my salary in Academy of Science before the war was 50 euro. Now I receive one euro and yesterday I was forced to, to sign a document that I agree to decrease of my salary. So low, low salaries, you know, um, is one of the main problem, uh, you know, so average sale, salary of Ukrainian teachers nowadays are below, you know, that the average salary in the country, but their, you know, conditions of their labor now is worsening, uh, are, are worsening, you know, they are killed by Russian rockets, they are responsible for kids in their, you know, they, um, uh, for kids in the school and so on. So poverty um, poses a great great challenge and I want to bring your attention to these poor Ukraine women we know that every you know four person in Ukraine is a pensioner and those women are abandoned and those women heavily relied on this you know network in this informal connections and now they are abandoned because many people left those territories you know younger mostly younger people and they are alone and they faced all these you know consequences we know know that Holocaust survivor who experienced um, the horse of Holocaust, some of them died like Vanda Ovietkova in during the siege of Mariupol without clean water, without, you know, food and without electricity. So, uh, of course, uh, it, it, uh, the, the main problem was war. And we, we should remember about those, you know, invisible people who are dying uh, because of the lack of the success for food, access to, to medication and, uh, uh, and so on. You can basically, you know, navigate on, on those slides and so on. So it's very, very important to remember about different groups of um, women in Ukraine, which nowadays are even more vulnerable than before the start of full-scale invasion. If we will consider all those women, we will realize the real price of this war. And I believe that in our world, when everyone, every state will actually realize the real price of this war, maybe our world will be more safe. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Marta, for this um, important perspective on the war we're going through. Um, if if there are any questions to Marta, I'm just reminding you to uh, text them, write them in the chat, and we will discuss those later. And now I'd like to invite Veronika to speak. Please remember that you've got 15 minutes. Okay, I'll do my best. I don't have a PowerPoint, so... That's I, fine. I hope uh, I can still keep your attention somehow. Oh, well, first of all, it's extremely hard to, you know, speak after such a strong and uh, basically difficult presentation from a country at war. Uh, obviously, Poland, my home country, is not at war. It is newly a frontline state. But everything I will say, therefore, necessarily will sound trivial and kind of, you know, still um, Poland is still, uh, especially the liberal voters, are still living very much this uh, European peace dream of end of history to some extent, less so than before. But we're still under this illusionary umbrella of peace. Um, so, so in this sense, you know, everything I will focus on will necessarily sound a bit less uh, uh, urgent, but I hope that what I thought I would talk about is I wanna talk about uh, the topic of women in defense in Poland and how it was affected by the Russian war in Ukraine because it really was affected very much so. And uh, then I want to briefly tell you where feminists have been in all of this. And the answer will be not very much so, unlike in Ukraine. And then I want to tell you how I see, uh, like my, one of my ideas, what I'm trying to kind of advocate for in Poland and in Central Europe, how I see uh, a future for 
how we could build a better, more feminist, more social democratic defense policy, because it is something that uh, I'm super passionate about for a number of years, obviously, as, uh, as we're watching the tragic events in Ukraine, it makes you really think about what we can do, um, you know, what we can do to defense uh, in our region. Uh, but of course, everything I'll say, I hope that there's something there that at least can serve as a, uh, you know, kind of reminder of maybe where we went wrong and where Ukraine doesn't need to go wrong, because there's many places where we did go wrong. So, but um, a few words about me. I'm a, a sociologist at the Polish Academy of Sciences. I work on social and institutional transformations in Central Europe but uh, mostly on topics of defense, militarism, war, memory of war, and gender. Uh, and my whole academic path began over 10 years ago with a research project and a book about women in World War II resistance. Uh, and a lot has changed since then. Back then, the book was, I don't, I still don't understand why at all, but it was pretty controversial, which didn't make any sense. But um, but uh, I got a lot of bad press for it. But we've come a long way since then. And uh, actually, 10 years after that book, just last month, we've opened the first feminist exhibition at the main museum of the Warsaw Uprising in Warsaw, just about women. And it was done by four feminists. So we, in this sense, there is a progression <laughs> that gives us hope. OK, but uh, I wanted to start by this question, where are we now? In, in terms of women and defense uh, and our thinking and our policy uh, in Poland and how has the Russian war in Ukraine affected this? So first and foremost, uh, like very quickly, because this is all boring and you probably know most of it. Um, basically during communism, women were not allowed in the army, which kind of went um, in Poland, which kind of went against long-term Polish traditions, which were from the late 19th century, 20th century, uh, there was a strong tradition of female um, defense and women in defense and women in paramilitarism, all connected to the independence struggle. Uh, and all that was more or less, you know, kind of reversed. Uh, women, of course, could be in civil defense during communism, but at the same time, the army became this really male institution. Um, and uh, so basically all the changes in terms of women and defense began after 1989 and were part of this broad politics of homogenization with Western security institutions, NATO and the EU. Um, but, you know, in this whole period, there's been a lot of gender mainstreaming done. Uh, it's been a very slow, I would say less ambitious than it should have been, but many things have been done. First of all, already in the late 80s, They've uh, basically in included ci female civilian workers of the military as soldiers in the army. Then in the 90s, uh, military academies were open to women, which obviously I know that just like in Ukraine, these changes brought about a lot of other things. Like, you know, we had to have toilets for women. We had to have uniforms and underwear for women. So all these things were happening in the 90s and early 2000s. Then I believe in the early 2000s, they've... Um, they have basically opened all positions in the army to women because before not all of them were open. So by then women could be in combat, they were joining special forces, they could go on expeditionary uh, peacekeeping missions and everything else. Uh, and in the meantime, there were some you know, gender mainstreaming regulations as well. Women got the right to maternity leave like in civilian sectors and uh, some basics of uh, and mobile anti harassment was implemented, but this is nowhere near where it should be. We right now have a whole document planned with like everything that should be done, but it's been stuck with the former government. So maybe hopefully now, uh, because it was prepared by the uh, by the ombudsman uh, with many. Uh, representatives of the of women in the security sector. And there's this whole report on how to have better regulations on mobbing and harassment, etc. But, you know, we'll see if there's actual political will on to do anything with this. And we know that this is always women's issues are always uh, the thing that gets done last. 
so now that's kind of where we are. But the most interesting aspect of it is that amidst this whole gender mainstreaming that was happening since 89 until the 2010, 2015, uh, all that gender mainstreaming was not accompanied by wide scale inclusion of women in the army. Basically in this whole period, women were maybe 2.5% of personnel. The maximum they got was like 4.5%. So what I'm trying to say is that there were changes. They did not cause any backlash, this I have to say, but also because there was there were so few women there that it was a, that they weren't really able to push for change from within. And this was kind of treated as a side topic. Now, here we're coming to the war in Ukraine and its effect. Basically, already in 2014, because that was the, the illegal annexation of Crimea, the war in Donbas, was this wake-up call for many for, in policy and politics in Poland that, you know, they finally stopped dreaming their strategic um, pause and kind of woke up. And that's when Poland really began this wide-scale defense uh, reforms. Uh, and the big part of it was, of course, personal build-up, armaments, but also opening up new forms of military service and new forms of engagement of citizens in defense. The most important one was territorial defense forces. So kind of like what you have to, right? I know that they collabor uh, collaborate. The Polish and Ukrainian territorial defense forces are pretty, They, I don't know, they train, they visit one another, et cetera. But so you know the concept. And these territorial defense forces were kind of a game changer because they introduced a new model of soldiering, a soldiering that is basically a model of citizen soldiers, not professional soldiers who are first and foremost soldiers, need to be highly mobile, move their whole families between garrisons every four years, but actually uh, soldiers that are citizens locally embedded and they can have their professional career, they can have a family, while they are, they're also soldiers on weekends or in crisis situations. And this is important because these new forms of military service, like territorial service, but also different other channels that I don't want to bore you with, but we now have some form of uh, volunteer defense ser uh, military service that's kind of like draft in the past, but it's not by volunteer. Then you have you can also do your military service through the academic legion program in universities when you're a student. You can also do different other forms. When you're a teenager, you can do a military class in your public school and then decide what's next. You can also join one of the many pro-defense and paramilitary organizations that are kind of NGOs, but still train. So there's many ways for citizens to become engaged. And what it all has done is that interestingly, it brought way more women into defense than ever before. So way more than the gender mainstreaming itself could do. And in just under six years, as a result, then the percentage of women doubled in the armed forces. And as I said, it was minuscule. It was less than 5%, but then it became around 10% of, uh, they say, professional service women. Uh, in territorial defense forces, I believe in just like six, years of their functioning or five, they've reached a level of 20% already. So, and uh, the retention rates for women are higher. So all I'm trying to say is that this opening up of this new form of engagement in defense, that's a bit more citizen soldier-like and a bit more civic and civilian in nature and easier to combine with other aspects of life. This is way more something that women can do without completely dropping out of their other like life aspects, right? Uh, and all of that, I think is why it's important is that because uh, of this, women hopefully will slowly reach this critical mass. Uh, hard to say how much that is. Some scholars say around 30, you need around 30% of any minority group in an institution to really for them to have a voice and to be able to uh, start some change. But either way, I think we're slowly getting there now. Now, um, of course, it's not all roses. Everything that Marta mentioned about Ukrainian armed forces and discrimination, harassment, um, problems with lack of regulations, et cetera, still exists. Um, and it's still something that women are struggling with, especially this uh, completely a dysfunctional anti-mobbing uh, and anti-harassment 
uh, regulations, but um, you know, but I'm not going to talk about that. But instead, I wanted to now move to where have feminists been in all of this? Because uh, after all, it's a panel about women and war, and I I do think that that's something that you may be interested to hear. Uh, first of all, well, it will be not a very nice story. I'll just say it straight up. Feminists have not had a voice uh, or a strong voice on defense and security in Poland at all, at least since uh, 1989, because obviously the early feminists of the first wave were very vocal on defense, and many of them were joining paramilitary groups, etc. but that's a very long time ago. Uh, so the post-1989 Polish feminism has not really been busying itself with these topics. So in many ways, all these changes that were happening were enforced or were the effect of this homogenization with Western institutions and were happening on the margins of public consciousness, uh, they weren't really driven by feminists. There, they, to be fair, there were a number of femocrats, so fe kind of female bureaucrats within the defense sector that were really the driving force. And we should, of course, be grateful to them, but they didn't necessarily derive from the feminist movement. So uh, one of the women who, who, who drove a lot of change I know when I was teaching in gender studies, she took our course <laughs> because she wanted to learn more. But this was, you know, later in life um, that she that she became interested in that. So, um, so basically, in many ways, the fem Polish feminist movement, academia, activism, NGOs, they sort of have long been stuck in this peacetime mentality. So they were, you know, busy with a lot of super important issues, reproductive rights, etc. But Defense and security, they did not touch. And in many ways, they also, I do believe, had a certain, um, how do I put it? They weren't really very eager to touch these topics because of this general climate in Western feminism, Western academia at that point in time, where uh, anything connected to nationalism, militarism was kind of dubious. And if anything, you could touch it with the critical perspective, but not to really like engage in the rebuilding of it. So, um, of course, the war in Ukraine changed a lot uh, in the sense that these topics re-entered public discussions and to some extent, some feminist discussions. And of course, I don't have to tell you that uh, Ukraine war is on our media daily. Uh, it's a topic of our, our of our academic discussions, NGO discussions. It's something that's really, really there. And we now have the best coverage of Ukraine politics we've ever had. I hope that stays this way forever uh, because of this, you know, more correspondence, more people actually writing about it weekly, etc. So in this sense, these topics entered our discussions. And I certainly was part of why you know, kind of trying to connect Polish media with Ukrainian feminists and trying to talk about what's happening there. But interestingly, while there's huge solidarity of Polish feminist movement with Ukrainian women, with Ukrainian defense, no Polish feminists have spoken in this pacifist, pacifist, pacifist voice about, you know, oh, we need peace and they should just stop fighting or we shouldn't arm them. No, of course, all my feminist colleagues on Facebook were also crowdfunding for drones and this is normal, but it did not affect feminist thinking on Polish defense and security at all. So in this sense, the, there is no, no difference than what has been there before. Feminists are still stuck in this peacetime mentality. There may be some psychological explanations to that that I, don't, I can't really figure out. But anyway, uh, there are still, I would say, there are now two strands of discussions and ac activities regarding defense and security in Poland from a feminist perspective. And I want to talk about both of them very briefly and then finish. So one is the strand that is discussing human security. So basically, I would say there is much more discussions of feminists that are now trying to rewrite and re-narrate their business as usual work refugee rights, women's shelters, violence, reproductive rights, but they're trying to re-narrate them as a security issue. And it's kind of talking about this broader human security. Now there's another strand of discussions, which is about the military per se. So kind of trying to talk about what's wrong with the military, what's wrong with this military culture, what needs to be changed and how the military, you know, 
it's kind of not, uh, uh, it's not a gender equal institution, et cetera. Now, I want to put it in a, the most nice way possible because I do respect both strands. I'm part of them myself and I do agree with them, but I have come to realize over the years of my own work that these two strands suffer from the same problem, namely that they, to some extent, reproduce this gendered binary of protectors and protected. Um, and I believe, and I'll just explain in a second, and I believe it came, that's where I came to in my own work and thinking about why in many places that we have the feminist human security work and discourse, in many places where we have the women in the military work and discourse, we still see the reemergence of the same patriarchal binary of male protectors and female protected. And how is that? And what? why is that, even though we have so much feminist work? And I do believe that it goes to boils down to this, that both these trends, the human security strand and the women in the military strand, they don't really uh, go against this, this protector protected binary. The human security strand ultimately is talking about very important issues, socioeconomic rights, uh, you know, migrant women's rights, sexual violence, but ultimately it's talking from this position but, uh, of asking the, let's say masculine state and military institutions to better protect us women, right? It's just saying, you're not protecting us well enough. You need to take this and that into consideration. It's not a strand that is uh, helping women form institutions where they actively, actively protect themselves. And in times of war, all these human security and feminist NGOs will ultimately join the hundreds of thousands of other civilians that will need to ask the male military for protection, to put it very, very bluntly. And now the other strand of discussions that is trying to criticize and change the military culture, it's again great, I've been doing that for 10 years in my uh, own country, but it, it, it again forgets that at the most, in the current reality of war in the region, we need maybe 10% of people in the military to, to actually well, be in combat. The rest of the people will not be in the military. So ultimately, the majority of women will still be out of it. So as much as we can ignite change in the military institution, it doesn't change the fact that the majority of women will still be the protected civilians in need of protection. Now, why I think it's so important, because over the years, I've seen over and over this tendency in Poland too, after World War II, and I now see we're going in exactly the same direction, that we're so shocked that we've come such a long way, written so many feminist documents and pamphlets, and we're still seeing the same protector, protected binary reemerge and to kind of retraditionalize gender order uh, during wartime. So what can be done, I believe, and this is just my kind of crazy idea that I've been advocating for in Poland, I found some other crazy people who are on my side, but it's still the very beginning, and with this I will finish, is namely that uh, I believe their hope lies in a less military-centric defense. Um, there is this defense paradigm that is called comprehensive defense, which of course, you know, can look differently in different countries. It's very popular and implemented in the Nordic states and in the Baltic states. And now in Central Europe, it is also becoming some somehow the blueprint for how we should do defense, but we're nowhere near where we should be. It's the beginning. It's just in our strategic documents, but we don't have it on the ground. Uh, and the idea there is that defense rests on four pillars. One of the pillars is the military, but then you have three civilian pillars, uh, public sector institutions, private enterprises, and civil society with all of us individuals. And the idea there is that the military is therefore just one of the pillars of defense, and all of these pillars are equally important and that they should be collaborating rather than the military taking over the whole defense. Uh, and why I think that's a hope for a feminist change to defense, more so than just changing the military or just doing outside human security, is because it's building this system that is not military-centric, 
but that actually has other pillars that are equally important that will have equal not equal but important funding will have its own functions uniforms resources and laws and that they actually can collaborate and you know the military can be freed from other tasks and can only take care of fighting while these other pillars can uphold the so-called resilience of the state and society in the crisis, and they can be their own authorities and upholding that. And why I think it's important for feminism is because when you read feminist literature on why feminists have an issue with military institutions, is precisely because of those unequal power relations in crisis, that the military male institution comes in and puts its authority over helpless civilians that are self-organizing in a crisis, uh, and therefore, I think if we had this comprehensive defense system in place, this would be a way to break out of this logic. Now, why it's also important is because we then can think of integrating women into broader defense institutions, not just the military. And, you know, I myself am now five months pregnant. Uh, before I did a military uh, training for civilians. I had a plan to actually get engaged, to uh, be one of the very few social democrats that actually do that in Poland, because it's not very much for uh, leftists are not very much interested in actively joining defense still. That's a big shame because the Polish traditions are that it was the Polish Socialist Party that was more pro defense in the olden days than the right wingers, but it's changed. But nevertheless, I know, now know that I can't do that for the, for the next months and maybe, maybe a year. Uh, but I could get engaged in civil defense structures, right, if we had them. I could get engaged in these other channels or I could get engaged in some type of uh, crisis management group in my own in, uh, public institution that I work in, if we had it. And this is kind of what we're missing right now. Uh, but joining these other type these other institutions that are responsible for defense kind of uh, that there's a much uh, lower threshold uh, of joining them not everyone will go and join combat uh, not everyone can not everyone can mentally as well but we all can do these other things so that's also kind of one reason how we can mobilize women for these other functions where they can still build their own agency, uh, protect themselves, have this sense of authority, uh, have resources, etc., but they don't need to necessarily be in the military. Now, uh, there's this also, this last thing I wanted to say, uh, namely that, um, that, yeah, that what's the practical element of it as well, of building this comprehensive defense rather than militarizing defense. Uh, that it's more in line with most women's capabilities. Uh, we can also mobilize women for their own protection rather than kind of reproduce this logic of them waiting for the protectors to come. Uh, and I think this is really crucial. And this idea that it can be only done for the military, I think was wrong. Uh, similar things, it's not, um, what I'm saying, I'm not also building out of nothing. Similar traditions you can find in the history of Finland, Estonia, to some extent Poland. In the interwar period, we've had those uh, countrywide women's paramilitary groups that were training civilian women. Uh, and then basically why that was important is that it gave women certain skills and knowledge that allowed them to protect their households. So they weren't so helpless, but it also gave them structures, resources, and capabilities where they basically had some authority in the realm of defense and they were part of it. So I think this is kind of potentially the way to go. Um, yeah, and I think that this is just, you know, I just wanted to tell you what we've been kind of working on among the few defense crazy uh, social Democrats in Poland. But I do think it's something to think about, especially since so far, our policy in Poland, but also in other countries in the region, has been very military-centric. And listening to what Marta was saying, reading a lot of great feminist inputs from Ukraine, I do think that if we don't stop that and if we don't push for this more comprehensive defense, we will see the reemergence of the same old patriarchal trope of, 
oh, you can have your uh, equality, but ultimately women, you know, need male protection of the military. And I think this is kind of maybe the missing link of what feminism was missing in our region and how, how we can have this new opening that it's not enough to be critical of the military. It's not enough to do human security. We just we need to actually be active agents in the building of defense. But it's very hard to finish. It's very hard to get um, left wing people on board with that. <laughs> so far, uh, they are actually much more happy to pay more taxes and subcontract that to add uh, to the military than to do anything themselves. And this is an interesting aspect of where the left is right now in terms of voters in Poland, that it's more like a lot of the left in the West with the value changes going on. It's less uh, about collective civic duties. It's more about, uh, you know, certain progressive values, but it doesn't necessarily prompt people to do these things, uh, to do these things themselves. And actually, when you look at how different voter groups approach defense, you see that those who are less least willing, the, the most unwilling to engage themselves in defense are those who declare themselves to be left-wing voters. So for the small left in Poland, it is a big task. What do we do to actually start engaging social democrats in, in this task and feminists? Okay, thank you so much. That's it. Do you want to step in or is there Olenka? I believe Olenka has issues with her Sorry. internet. Are you here, Olenka? Yeah, I I lost the connection for like five seconds, I guess. Can you hear me okay? Okay, um, Thank you, Veronika. Uh, we're terribly running out of time, so I'm just uh, giving the floor to wow. Anwar. Yeah, thank you. I know. I'm going to try to keep time. I'm going to have a stopwatch. Um, so um, as uh, Alenika uh, said, uh, my name is Anwar Mahajni. Um, I do want to clarify my positionality in the conflict and in Israel-Palestine situation because I think it's important. It's different experiences, different perspectives on, on what's happening. So I am Palestinian, uh, but I also hold Israeli citizenship. I, I am part of the 20% inside of Israel who are historically Palestinian, but because of kind of the geographical changes that happened in uh, 1948, uh, we were included with what's now called the State of Israel. Um, but I do uh, lots of research on women and gender, gender Islamism, conflict, um, and I do definitely, um, you know, work on issues related to Palestinian women in the West Bank and Gaza as well. Um, it's very hard to talk about these issues right now since they're unfolding currently. Um, Honestly, since October 7, I don't think I've slept like a decent person. Um, every, the images are very gruesome. Like what I, the images that I'm getting from what happened in Israel on October 7, you know, children and women were also targeted from Hamas extremists, as well as uh, the impact on children and women in Gaza, as well as men, innocent men, men combatants. Uh, so the death toll has been, um, you know, weighing on me and to just, it's a lot emotionally to unpack. Um, and as I said, because of the positionality of where I am as Palestinian, historically Israeli by citizenship, we are also occupying a very vulnerable position there um, where we're um, getting, you know, some of us were killed due to the Hamas attack, but also now we're targeted as a minority in Israel, because we are talking about the civilian death toll, um, and as well, you know, and then we are also the connection to the Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank kind of means that we are more att attentive to their national needs and national kind of aspirations, right? Um, so to talk about Palestinian women, um, we have a rich history right here, um, but I think it's it, for me to classify it, I think there, there are two forces here, one, two or three. One is kind of patriarchal practices that exist within society, and this could also interwine and interconnect with religious groups, and I'll talk about the differences between, for instance, secular groups 
um, and religious groups in, in the Palestinian, uh, under Palestinian national uh, uh, resistance or political parties. And then there's, of course, the occupation, the experience with uh, a system that exists in the West Bank and the siege in Gaza that affects how women experience conflict differently as well in both areas. But also Hamas in Gaza and the PLO in the West Bank also means that there are two different experiences as well for women in those areas, as well as kind of the level of international engagement and funding that gets funneled through the West Bank is totally different than Gaza. So it's that she's women's experiences as well. Um, as to start out with the occupation, maybe is one unified experience. I have to say that women have been experiencing a variety of issues on top of the issues that women in Ukraine have exp are experiencing in Poland. So I know uh, Marta talked about poverty, issues with motherhood, sexual violence, gender-based violence. But in addition to that, there is home demolition cases where Palestinian women are, there are lots of families that lose their home suddenly, and there is no place, safe place for them to go to. Uh, this not only is happening now in Gaza due to the war, right, where we see, uh, I think about the UN estimated 40% of buildings were damaged or destroyed, uh, leaving about half, uh, leaving a million people without homes in Gaza. So it's just a huge number. Uh, but also we see in Jerusalem and in the West Bank, not as a massive of a destruction, but we see that there are cases of home demolition because there is no, they don't get um, li kind of license to build. It's very hard to come by, especially if you're building in East Jerusalem. Um, you also, uh, you know, if for instance, uh, somebody is accused of terrorism or if uh, let's say a family member uh, goes and attacks uh, and orchestrates an attack against Israelis, uh, there's a policy of home demolition, right? Regardless of if the family knew about it, if the family were involved. Uh, so we see that home, like the loss and home demolition, ex uh, the extensive level of that. We also have, I think in 2022, according to the Palestinian Bureau of Statistic, um, about 172 women were detained. Um, 18 women were uh, killed. Um, a lot of women avoid checkpoints. Uh, there are stories of women delivering babies at checkpoints, not being able to get to hospitals because of, uh, you know, the the level of control that Israel has on mobility of Palestinians that affects that. Um, so that's kind of in general, just to kind of outline some basic levels of control that exists. And of course, they can be impacted even further. Um, in the West Bank, uh, we see, though, that the PLO or the Palestinian, the Palestinian Authority governs the West Bank. They all have their own um, laws that are also not friendly toward women, in addition to the experience of the occupation. Uh, we also see uh, kind of patriarchal practices of, you know, uh, women are limited to the home, less engagement with labor. So we have higher rates of women graduating from colleges. But when you look at the engagement in the labor market, it drops drastically. And this is common across, like, even for Palestinian women inside of Israel and even for Palestinian women in Gaza, where they're more highly educated. But then when it comes to the labor market, uh, that rate drops. Um, and it, it's for a variety of reasons, because women, after getting educated, they get married and the family situation, so they uh, don't engage in the labor market. Um, there is also, in addition to that, um, the PLO considers itself secular, and they're heavily engaged with the UN, with international organizations. Um, there's a, a civil society, kind of body of civil society run by women in, in the West Bank, um, who are very active, connecting, you know, domestic groups with international groups, uh, talking about the needs of the Palestinians in general and Palestinian women in particular. Um, now going to um, Gaza and the West Bank. Um, so uh, Gaza, sorry, we talked about that, about the West Bank to talk about Gaza. Um, I'm going to state the numbers just right now, of what's happening. Um, according to U.S. women, about half a million women and girls were displaced. Um, we see that two out of the approximately 10,000 that were killed, uh, 2,326 uh, were women, 3,760 3, uh, were children, um, about 67% of those who killed are women and children. And I wanna hear it talk a little bit about the concept of protection. You know, for the longest time, I did believe in the feminist critique of kind of putting women, like that of problematizing the label of protected women, women and children. 
Um, and that the fact it disregards also women's roles as combatant, for instance, the PLO, which is a secular group in the West Bank, did have, uh, and the PFLP, which is the uh, Popular Friend for the Liberation of Palestine, did have women who engaged in violence. We also know women who engaged in suicide bombing um, as part of that. So yes, there's that innocence kind of, or just viewing them as victims. Uh, can be problematic in this case. But what I'm struggling with is right now when the narrative about who's combatant, who's not combatant, and the numbers being contested, you know, there's this debate that, oh, this is disproportionate, discriminate, uh, indiscriminate bombing. And a lot of, uh, you know, on the Israeli side, they're claiming that this is necessary and they're killing a lot of combatants. And these numbers are not taking into account the number of combatants being killed. But then there's also the fact that groups like Hamas who are extremely religious and don't really engage women in combat. Um, they do believe, like initially they believe women's role is in the household, reproduction, producing the nation, having more kids, uh, passing on kind of religious and patriarchal and national identity to their kids. Um, you see them active in the Shura Council, but that's non-binding. They're not involved in the political um committee or the, as I said, the military wing of Hamas that planned the terrorist attacks inside of Israel. Um, so for me, it's kind of interesting because if we want to debate that, then and we might fall into a problematic narrative where, okay, everyone, you know, there's this narrative that I've heard, problematic narrative that everyone in Gaza is responsible for what happened inside of Israel. I don't know if you've heard that, which is very pro problematic on a lot of levels. And also the fact that, like, you know, Gaza didn't have elections in 16 years about 50% are children under 18, so they weren't even, even able to vote. And besides, Hamas ran a campaign that is just like based on social services and like an alternative to the PA that was viewed corrupt. I don't think like the campaign was ran on uh, destroying Israel or like committing um, uh, the acts that Hamas committed inside of Israel um, that are also horrendous. I and mean, we can talk also about how they use social media to broadcast that to the world. Um, so I, I don't know, maybe it's just, a, and again, this is, I haven't thought through this a lot. This is something that came up in my mind as you guys were talking about, you know, the label of protected individuals, women and children, always tying women and children together and they're protected. But in this case, I find it like it might be a little bit also kind of interesting to see when it makes sense and when it doesn't make sense to talk about these things. Um, you know, do, so I, I said half a million displaced. Oh, there are widows now that are running their household, um, you know, with a lack of water, sanitary conditions, um, lack of medical supplies. So these widows are responsible for taking care of their families. And that's kind of an added burden. Um, also, there are stories that hospitals of women delivering babies on having C-sections without anesthesia. Um, you know, women bleeding because of birth and not the doctors not e being able to treat them or even having to like take their womb out. I can't remember the term for it because that would that's the fastest way to stop the bleeding, even though in normal conditions, there are other ways that you could use. Um, I think the U UN Women estimates that there is like, like 50,000 women pregnant and around 5,000 of them are supposed to give birth this month. Uh, and they're doing it under severe I mean, impossible conditions, right? Um, in the Gaza Strip right now. Um, so, uh, you know, on a lot of levels, um, women in Gaza are facing extreme severe consequences that are not common right now in the West Bank, but I'm not gonna say that the West Bank is not boiling right now. We have about over hundred people were killed. Um, we see communities displaced in the West Bank, like between the Jordan Valley and um and uh the West Bank and Ramallah I think I think they said around 13 14 communities which brings it around 400 to 1000 people who were displaced forcibly displaced and displaced by settler violence uh the militarization of Israeli society right now arming settlers and arming civilians is becoming really dangerous for a lot of people in the West Bank um you know, we saw a lot of activists, um, Palestinian activists um, that have emerged and became prominent. Um, there's this uh, girl, her name is Shahdil, I can't remember her last name, who became like this uh, iconic woman, child, who's an activist and was uh, uh, considered this oppositional force to militarization uh, and showing the kind of the ugly face of the occupation to the Palestinian side. Um, on the extreme side, there's Layla Khaled, who was in, you know, involved in the 60s and 70s in plane hijacking, and um, she was labeled as a terrorist. 
Um, so it's kind of, there are two kind of ways where you can view Palestinian women. There's the combatant, but there's also the social activist that's using peaceful means um, in order to kind of, well, I mean, um, elevate the situation as much as possible. Um, there's also lots of reporters like Shirin Abu Akhle, women are engaged in uh, civil kind of resistance in a way where they're just reporting what's happening in the ground. In Gaza, we saw a lot of reporters being killed. The fact that no foreign press is allowed on the ground makes it, uh, puts the burden on uh, journalists on the ground. And a lot of these journalists are women. Uh, one of them um, actually was just targeted and claimed that she's like the propaganda face of Hamas. Um, even though she's just like literally, if you follow her Instagram account, and I'm happy to give you some suggestions on Instagram accounts to follow, uh, a lot of them are women. Uh, she's just like taking videos of what's happening on the ground. Nothing doctor, just like you're seeing demolitions, you're seeing suffering like firsthand. Um, so we see a big burden on these journalists as well and the dehumanization. We know about Shirin Abu Akhle, the Al Jazeera reporter that was shot. Um, and Israel initially denied it was them who killed her. But, you know, after a year, um, they admitted that an Israeli soldier killed her. Um, so even like at the level of press, we see targeting. I mean, it's indiscriminate, indiscriminate men and women, but we see a, a large number of women engaged in kind of reporting on the ground. Um, so we see also that level um, happening. Um, it's... Uh, you know, for groups like Hamas as well, one thing that I want to mention um, is they view women's roles at the social level as the most important role uh, that you could have, because as I said, religiously, you are kind of playing the complementarity role rather than like the equality role. You're, you're kind of necessary. You, you play an important role, but that is complementary to what men are doing and you are keeping the domestic front. So even by cooking or cleaning or raising the kids and taking care of the household, you are allowing, you know, you're helping the cause by doing so. Um, and they put like family at, the, uh, an, at an utmost uh, importance and also having more kids, right? Because if you lose a lot of people, then having more kids is important for national production and national identity. Um, so yeah, I think I'm gonna um, pause here. Uh, oh, maybe like just some statistics on um, you know how women women political participation um, in Gaza. There, you know, since 2007, there was the separation between the Palestinian Authority and Gaza Strip that is run by Hamas. Um, so there's only one minister in Gaza, and that's the Minister of Women, that is uh, a female, and she's the Minister of Women's Affairs. However, in the PA and the PLO, we see more we see more engagement of women and more participation of women. I think three out of twenty four ministerial level positions are uh, held by women in the Palestinian cabinet. Twenty point nine percent of national parliamentarians are women. Um, and then we see even in the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, at their council, they have 65 women, which is about um, 8%. Uh, Tens are, out of the 65 are member of the PLO Central Committee. One out of the 18 sit at the PLO Executive Committee. Uh, we see 4.3% of ambassadors in the PLO, uh, you know, for the PLO or the Palestinian Authority. Um, and then... And as I said, like Palestinian women have been active and engaging in resistance on multiple levels and different levels, but their experiences differ for, you know, depending on where they are located, West Bank or Gaza, and also uh, the, their relationship with the occupation or not relationship, because that's the wrong way to describe it, but their experiences with the occupation, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anwar. Um, I hope my connection is better now. So we've got just, I think, um, 15 minutes for questions, but there aren't many, fortunately. Um, so, there is uh there is a question to Marta from uh, Yuri. I'm just going to read it out loud 
quickly. So um, the question goes, nationalists and right-wing radicals are the most active volunteer soldiers. They have been waiting for a war with Russia from 1991. They say that they get a kick out of fighting. They call the war a healing war. Uh, nationalist uh, regiments and brigades are among the best trained. The government declares heroes of the war, mainly people with nationalist views. That is why uh, right-wing radical discourse and right-wing radical cu cultural uh, hegemony prevailed during the war. That is why state propaganda is silent about all the problems with nationalists. Uh, what to do about it? That's the question to Marta. Thank you so much for this wonderful question. First of all, what we observe in Ukraine society nowadays, we have problems not only with state propaganda, but we have problems with civil society as well, and nationalistic turn in civil society as well. Because if we take the question of, um, for example, this infamous exhibition in a, a museum of history in Kyiv, where created by former Azo members who compared themselves basically with members of Waffen SS Galicia, so Nazi unit. What we observe this exhibition was created. Okay, it was created by military, but it was opened in one of the most popular, you know, museum in the city center in the Kyiv, in the capital of Ukraine. So many reporters, so many journalists actually were present in the opening ceremony. Uh, our, you know, Ministry of Culture was, was there, so many public figures, so many activists, and so on, and nobody. Nobody actually, no one raised the question, maybe it's um, problematic, you know, to compare our soldiers with Nazi unit. So what we observe now, we have self-censorship, we have fear, and we have the absence of critical voices. Why? Because for different reasons. And one of the reason is the dominance of military people inside Ukraine. They are decorated, they are celebrated, and they have the power, you know, just to, and nobody even, and, and you know, the scandal was, you know, the sexist show when feminist organizations, feminist activists, they raised the question about this, and now they receive threats from far-right groups. And our liberal intellectuals are silent about these threats. So nowadays, far-right violence uh, is legitimized in Ukraine society. Why? Because, because they are effective militant and everyone expects from them just defend. De so they receive the free hand actually to do whatever they want just to to just to fight so what we need we need to raise our voices journalists human rights activists you know feminists everyone and to just undermine this hegemonic narrative we should have the civil courage to undermine all this and support each other and not to be silent about human rights violation and the lack of academic freedom inside ukraine nowadays but I want to, I have a question to Veronika, actually. I really like your idea of comprehensive defense, but I really believe this idea and this concept is uh, fit only for the nation without war, for peacetime. Why? Because you're in time. Only military pay the ultimate price. They are losing their lives. They are losing there. So they will be always in the top of key hierarchy. They will always di dictate their rules, like today in Ukraine. They will always make, you know, um, different difficulties, barriers for women to enter military. And they will always underestimate efforts of other sectors, civilian, se civil society, you know, public sphere, and so on, so on, because they are paying ultimate price that we not are paying. You know, my advocate efforts can't be, you know, equalized with their efforts. So this, I believe this idea is um, highly problematic. And I'm sorry, I have a question to Anwar. Anwar, 
let me express my solidarity with those women in Gaza and West Bank in Eastern Jerusalem who are suffering these tragic, you know, tragic events. I am really, I am really sorry. I am really sorry. So I have a question. Elizabeth Wood, when she developed her typology of sexual violence during war, she said, she claimed, you know, there are wars where we don't have basically sexual violence. And one of the examples is, is Israel-Palestine uh, Israel conflict. And I doubt this because I saw reports from human rights organization and we know that some, um, for example, cases of sexual harassment are um, against uh, Palestinians that take play in, play, place in prisons and places of deprivation. So what can you say about this? And another question, you know that in Ukraine, what I, what I observe now, the lack of empathy towards uh, vulnerable uh, Palestinian uh, uh, people in Gaza, including children and women, um, is the consequences of this myth that all actually uh, Gaza women support Hamas and all these terrorist attacks and this brutality and all these crimes and, and so on and so on. We know that we don't have polls comprehensive polls, we don't, we don't have these elections for six, 16 years, but could we measure ex, actually political, you know, views of women? Because we know that Hamas is deeply oppressive against their own women, deeply oppressive, deeply repressive, and so on and so on. It's actually that they should fight against Hamas themselves. So how can we measure actually, actually their support or lack of support to, to Hamas? Thank you so much. Veronica, you want to go first or do? You... Oh, uh, maybe if you want to answer this last question, then that would be because, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, actually I just saw a report by the Air Barometer. Um, you know, she is run. It's a survey that is run in the Arab world in general, and it um the woman that runs it, she's the dean at Princeton. The I can't remember what college, uh, but um the the poll actually measured opinion about Hamas right before the October 7th attack. And I think you can look it up um, and it is, it's a kind of great, it, it breaks it down, but the support for Hamas was really the majority were in supportive of Hamas. I don't know if she broke it down to gender, but it shows kind of like overall picture, but I'm sure they did like control for gender. I haven't dug into it, but I'm sure there's like a, a way to get the results. Um, and so that's interesting, but also, you know, even that narrative that like if you voted for Hamas 16 years ago then you deserve to die is very problematic why first of all because as I said Hamas was before becoming super militant engaged in like social services like any Islamist movement right like the Muslim Brotherhood why were they popular I mean Hamas is kind of like a an extension of the Muslim Brotherhood because they provided services, uh, they provided, like, they engaged in civil society organizations. There are reports actually that has that have been verified that Israel was interested in strengthening Hamas as a group, right? Um, there is archival evidence that shows that, and also there is the intel the leaked intelligence. Um, I don't know if you guys saw that, but a, a leaked intelligence kind of uh, report. Um, that was kind of a suggestion of what to do after, you know, the day after, the day after you get rid of Hamas. So the ministry gave three options. One of them is to get rid of Hamas and bring the PLO that's like the West Bank, uh, like the PA from the West Bank to Gaza. Two, to allow like for a local group to emerge in Gaza. Three, to displace all Palestinian to Sinai. And this is a verified intelligence document that you can find, okay? Um, it's in Hebrew. It was leaked two days ago. They said the worst option would be to uh, allow the PLO to go to the West Bank, to Gaza, because that means it's closer to building a Palestinian state. So it indirectly admits that Hamas was helpful for preventing a Palestinian state from emerging because it created that dichotomy between the West Bank and um, Gaza. Um, and they said the most attainable option is to displace all Gazans to Sinai using allies to pressure Egypt to take refugees and then build tent cities in a buffer zone and eventually build actual cities for those Palestinians. So added to kind of like those fears that Palestinians had initially, 
they were proven by that document, right? Now, Netanyahu says, well, it was just like a recommendation. It's not our official policy, right? But the eviction order, evacuation order that like was like 1.1 million people, you've got to get out in 24 hours, right? Emptying hospitals. So that brought that fear again toward Palestinian. So I think that narrative even is is kind of problematic because you don't understand Hamas. There are multiple forces that strengthen that allow ha Hamas to prosper. So yes, Palestinians did vote for Hamas in 26, 2006. And yes, Hamas and the PLO had civil war that happened because nobody wanted Hamas to take over. And yes, Hamas is an oppressive regime. If you talk to Gazans, they'll tell you they're being overtaxed where Hamas is using like extra tax for money to fund their tunnels. Uh, there were lots of problematic statements by Hamas leaders who said, these people are not our responsibility. Our responsibility is a national struggle. When he was asked, why are you building tunnels and you're not like uh, building shelters for these citizens, for these civilians? So even Hamas doesn't care about these citizens, right? They don't care about the civilians. And also, if you vote for like uh, an oppressive regime and that regime tends to like engages in war crimes, are every citizen of that country responsible for what's happening, right? So I think like the logic is very problematic in a lot of levels, regardless of the poll. But I can like you can look up the poll. Um, it's uh, look up Air Barometer in Gaza or Amani Jamal. That's her name. I can type her name in the chat in a little bit. Um, who has that poll and the survey from inside of Gaza? Um. What was the other uh, sexual violence? So I think there are like reports of sexual harassment that I know, like, you know, checkpoints that are common. Um, in the case of Gaza, a lot of it is bombardment from up top. You know, this is like kind of detached, not soldier on the ground. Um, and I honestly personally never heard of like, I've heard of centers like raping women before. Um, I've never seen any official reports, at least on my end, that like documented a huge number of kind of sexual um, violence um, happening against Palestinian women um, by Israeli soldiers. I know there's sexual harassment that happens at checkpoints. I know um, that, you know, women have been blackmailed <laughs> to collaborate based on like in intelligence information that questions their morality or something like that. But I can't, like I know, and I said some settlers, like there was settler, like stories of rape and settler violence, but I don't know if there's anything more, um, like larger numbers of uh, sexual violence against uh, Palestinian women by Israeli soldiers. And again, that's up to my knowledge. I don't know if you can find other reports. Um, but yeah, I think these are were the two questions, right? Thank you. So maybe, because we don't have time and I don't want to take too much, I'll just answer Marta's, Marta's question. It's a very good comment. I completely uh, empathize and understand it, that the comment was that uh, you can't really build this comprehensive defense in a war and, and that ultimately, right, the um, those who fight, the, who are active combatants will always have a higher status because they sacrifice their lives. So um, the first part, yeah, we cannot build that in a war. That's why I'm so kind of um, anxious and obsessed with it that Poland has not managed to build it since uh, 1989. And even the war in Ukraine only forced us to start the, building the blocks of it. While I would say some societies that have, I would say, been more advanced and more had a more, let's say, uh, how do I put it nicely? Had a more of uh, had more foresight and more respect for human life and for upholding societal democratic life, like the Finnish society, have been building that for decades. So they're not really, you know, shocked. They have it in place. Uh, but the point is that so of course you have to build it before, but it's also one of those things where you know we all know one day very soon Ukraine will be. Uh, not in war, Ukraine will win. And then there will be this huge long process of how can we rebuild defense differently so that the military isn't the sole institution that holds all the power, all the agency, all the resources, but maybe that in a way that actually also revalues civilian civic society actors and includes them as actors, as agents. Uh, but of course, this so this is one thing, the reason I'm thinking about it even is because I just have been so helpless with all of this. 
uh, and seeing how we are on the path to basically repeating the same mistakes. And, you know, then I spent 10 years in feminist uh, criticism of militarism, and I kind of came to this conclusion that my constant bemoaning of, oh, when this happens and women are the protected, and we are, again, falling into the same trap, that it's not really helping rebuild things. So I was starting to think, what can I do to at least be closer to uh, changing these institutions? Uh, so that's kind of that's kind of the only thing I see. I think it's still, of course, I do agree that when there's a war, those who are sacrificing their life on the front lines will have a special status. And maybe in the symbolics of war, they will be more valued symbolically, and we can't do much about this. Uh, and maybe that's even okay, and that should be it. And I should, I'm not taking a personal you know, issue with this because I somehow, you know, my heart is also there. Um, at the same time, I think there are still benefits to having this comprehensive defense system and benefits for women and women's equality, namely that you then engage civilians in their own protection, give them resources, give them structures, give them functions, uh, give them agency skills and knowledge, so that at least this binary of passive female objects of protection and male protectors is not to the same extent reproduced. Sure, the status differential between the life givers and other life protectors may still exist, and it may be gendered, but it's not as bad as as the as what we've seen so far. So I would still give it a shot, uh, because maybe you know. And just to finish, I remember this was a huge thing with the women from the Warsaw Uprising of 1944 that I interviewed ten years ago. That basically women in the Warsaw Uprising, apart from very few example, uh, exceptions, weren't combatants. They weren't fighting with guns. There was actually a lot of social pressure for them to not do that. But they did a ton of other things. Uh, you know best because you're a historian, so you know what kind of things women did in the underground in World War II. Uh, nevertheless, the point is that slowly but steadily, the women from the Warsaw, the female combatants, over the years changed the discourse around it. And they said, it's a problem that we have this heroic status of combatants, but we don't see how crucial these other things are. And that every time they give talks today on the media, these old women, they say that we have to have a broader understanding of how crucial these other functions are for defense. And today it's even, it's men too saying the same. So there is still a chance to, you know, make it more equalized to some extent. But of course I do agree that fully we cannot do that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you all very much for this. Um, thank you, Anwar, Veronika, and Marta for sharing your knowledge and perspectives with us today. And many, many thanks to our interpreters for their hard work as well as to all my colleagues who are organizing this conference and to our audience for your interest in the topic and the questions. Unfortunately, we, we don't have time for more questions um, because we're already super late. Um, yeah, thank you all. And uh, I'd like to remind you that there will be three more panels tomorrow, all online. Please check our social media for more information. And have a nice evening, I guess. Thank you so much. Have a nice evening. Have a nice day. Take care. Thank you so much.